Okay, I think we can get started. Um, I want to welcome everybody to Earth Day, a uh, virtual Earth Fest on behalf of Biosphere 2 and the University of Arizona. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, share in a Q&A and discussion webinar with Dr. Laura Meredith and Dr. Christiane Warner. Uh, Laura had got her PhD in climate physics and chemistry from MIT. Uh, she is the director of rainforest research at Biosphere 2 and an assistant professor in the School of Natural Resources at the University of Arizona. Um, Christiane is the chair of ecosystem physiology at the University of Freiburg, and she received her PhD from the University of uh, Belfield in experimental biology and ecosystem studies. Um, so it's, it's a real privilege to have uh, the two uh, leaders of the Biosphere 2 uh, WALD, which stands for Water, Atmosphere, and Life Dynamics, the Biosphere 2 WALD campaign, which took place this last year uh, in the rainforest. Um, we have those, uh, those leaders here with us today uh, to answer some questions. And I want to start off in the spirit of Earth Day, and I'll let both of you answer. Uh, this will be the hardest question of the panel. What is a forest? And Laura, let's start with you. Uh, well, one definition of a forest could be a type of ecosystem that invests a lot in reaching up above ground to um, extend the way that plants um, interact with their environment to upper, higher and higher levels in the canopy. And so really when we think about forests, I think we, we think of the extension of competition for light upward into the atmosphere. And it's just another illustration of how strongly the biosphere uh, and its plants and animals and microorganisms are interacting with our atmosphere. And Christiane, how about uh, your view of what is a forest? Well, um, here in Germany, there is a saying, um, a forest is more than just a lot of trees. And I think this is pretty much uh, assembling it. It's, it's a very complex interplay. Of course, we have the dominant tree canopies, which build up this forest. But in the end, the forest is everything. It's um, the soil with all its processes, the microbes, the roots, the mycorrhiza. It's the trees, it's the animals. And it's uh, a lot of exchange happening within this system. So it's a quite interesting and very complex system. And I think. Um, looking worldwide, um, these are the biggest ecosystems taking up carbon, so they're really important to our forests, and that's why they are so interesting to study. Now, uh, forests around the world are uh, in a fairly abundant supply, but why did you two choose a forest inside a greenhouse system uh, out of all the forests out there uh, to, to do your research? Uh, Christiana, do you want to start with that? Because you had the idea even before I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the forest in the biosphere is absolutely unique because what we have is both, we have both like a controlled system and a natural system. And I think this is really the one place on earth where we can control, manipulate and measure a full ecosystem of a forest inside what we would call a big cuvette. So normally we study plants by enclosing a leaf or putting a single plant into a small cuvette. And here they have a full for forest which has been grown very naturally for many, many years and are able to study all these processes within an enclosure where we can control, control the atmosphere, we can control the rain um, and many other factors. So for a scientific research program, this is just a unique forest where you have the possibility of big scale manipulation experiments. And Laura, do you want to chime in on that? Yeah, my research, I'm really interested in what happens below ground. What do soil microorganisms um, do to make their living? How do they, um, how do they survive? How do they compete with each other? And an important aspect is also how they interact with plants and interact with um, the, the environmental factors and forcings. And so already those are so many different interactions that um, you know, it illustrates how complex it is to study soils and soil microbes. 
And so it's really a wonderful thing to have this extra level of control. Um, uh, for example, we turned off the rain so you can control whether or not it rains. And we also introduced um, different tracers, isotopic tracers that allow us to um, sort of have more uh, leverage to understand what is happening even in complex ecosystems. So for me, it's, um, I think there's a lot of advantage to studying the above ground forest. And then with this extra control, you can also study the complex interplay with below ground processes. And I think Laura just mentioned really the one big point for our experiment, and that, that was the ultimate reason why I choose to come to Biosphere 2 is um, we use this stable carbon isotope labels, which are just naturally abundant, so they're not radioactive, but we can apply them to give a signal in the atmosphere and we can see how this is uptaken by plants and how this is traveling through the plants, through the trees, into the soil. And this is something which would never be possible in a natural forest because if you would just blow it in the air, it would just go by the wind. So this is absolutely unique that we could close the whole system airtight. We could apply this big label study and see how the carbon is traveling through the system. And um, that was actually the first idea when I went to Biosphere 2 and I thought like, well, this is the one place where we can do that. And for those of you just joining us, we are talking about a rainforest enclosed in a giant greenhouse. And this greenhouse is a part of the Biosphere 2 facility in Southern Arizona. And within this rainforest, uh, there are a variety of kind of sub uh, uh, ecosystems. And maybe Christian and Laura, you could just kind of give a blanket description of uh, your rainforest. Uh, how many trees, plants, uh, what kinds of uh, features? Uh, everybody right now is, is looking at the, the rainforest mountain, uh, but maybe just give us, take us into the forest uh, in your own words. Mm -hmm. So the forest is beautiful because it's heterogeneous. That is, it has a lot of different micro environments within it, like real ecosystems do. And so this is one other advantage beyond going to say an agricultural greenhouse to study monocultures of crops. In this system, we have um, about 70 different uh, plant species now um, uh, and multiple different types of trees that are dominating the canopy and they're living in different micro environments that have different miniature watersheds, different elevations, which translates to different environmental um, forcings. And this is really great for us because um, we know that in real ecosystems, this type of complexity and um, spatial differences really um, do impact the whole ecosystem process. And that's something that we can't study in monoculture. And so it's nice that we have this extra level of control that we were just talking about that helps us simplify some of the science, but yet we're not simplifying how an ecosystem can be complex. So up and down this mountain you see in the middle, we have different sub, you know, clusters of different plants um, in lowlands, um, in floodable forest areas, in the upper layers that are very, very hot, um, that really allow us to look at diverse ecosystem processes and diverse responses of plants and microbes within this ecosystem. And uh, just a little bit of context with a question from Facebook. Uh, somebody asked, why didn't you include animals in the biosphere? And perhaps you could speak to that question, but also uh, speak to the fact that this forest that you're studying is about 30 years old. And it was designed uh, 30 years ago with uh, tons of species, including some species and some uh, animals and excluding some species and some animals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I can take that again. So, I mean, this is, these are engineered ecosystems from the beginning. And one of the concepts was to overstock with different species and allow some of the natural selection processes to happen to ensure that there would be survival, but you know, some of the best suited plants and animals for that uh, ecosystem would survive. And initially there were a lot of um, different animals, different members of what we call the trophic levels, so like different members of the food chain that were present in this ecosystem. Um, and of course, there was a lot of effort that went into making sure that none of the plants or animals would be uh, dangerous for the humans that were living inside at the time. 
Um, today, we really mostly have plants, we have microbes, and they have uh, interactions that have developed over 30 years, which is really great. There are some insect species, um, but the, the main animals in there are humans, our scientists um, and our tourists that we um, really enjoy uh, showing the facility when we can. Um, and you know that is not the same as um, a tropical uh, forest that will have really high biodiversity and a lot of animal life. Um, but for us, we st we're mainly studying carbon cycling, water cycling, and actually a lot of our ecosystem models, they don't necessarily include animals either. And so we're still able to test some of the most fundamental um, understanding we have about ecosystem carbon and water cycling with this model system, um, even though we're not necessarily representing some animal interactions, which of course are important, um, but we feel we have a lot of other things to learn in the meantime, um, even without them. Yeah, and uh, kind of playing off of that, we have a question uh, from Norway. Uh, Rune asked, how are rainforests worldwide being affected by climate change? And maybe you guys could connect that back to your research uh, once you answer it. Yeah, um, so I think worldwide there is a large concern about um, the carbon um, sink capacity, especially of tropical rainforests, declining. There's actually a brand new scientific um, paper in Nature, which is extrapolating changes they have been observing in both uh, African and um, Southern American rainforests, especially the Amazon. And it seems like the overall capacity to withstand these extreme climatic events is declining. And if these projections are right, the big carbon sink, which currently these tropical rainforests are providing, they're kind of the lungs of our planet, absorbing a lot of CO2. This might decline with global change. Um, severe are uh, frequent droughts and recurring droughts, and that is a phenomenon we unfortunately see more and more frequently. Um, droughts have always existed, also in tropical forests, but the frequency and the severity with which they are appearing is increasing. So um, that's also one of the reasons why we choose to implement um, a big drought experiment into this um, biosphere rainforest to really study on a semi-controlled conditions how such a severe drought can impact these systems. Thank you. And uh, just to briefly uh, describe, uh, Laura and Christian spearheaded a research campaign this last year uh, that consisted of about 100 uh, researchers from all different fields. And in the Biosphere 2 rainforest, uh, they initiated a severe uh, full ecosystem drought. And that meant shutting off the water and letting the soil and the plants and the trees really dry out. And I will cut to a photo of a, a difference between a healthy forest and a forest under drought uh, in this photo you see here. And uh, maybe you guys could describe uh, how you were studying this drought and maybe the different phases of experimentation, starting with a healthy forest versus a forest under severe drought and stress. Yeah, so we outlined a, it was about five months in the end, a five month experiment to understand how um, carbon and water cycling were occurring in this forest under control conditions. So on that photo you're showing on the top where uh, the forest is, is healthy and happy and well watered uh, into it, a severe drought. We went for 66 days with no rain um, at all to this ecosystem that's used to getting rain every two or three days. So it was really severe. We also made sure to um, to purge any groundwater, so any sort of deep water that was in the system. And so they, these, um, this forest was very um, stressed out. We, we didn't push it beyond the point of recovery, but we got it to a very, very stressed level. And then we re-wet the system um, and watched the recovery. Um, and I'll let uh, Christiana describe some of the isotope labeling, but just briefly, we um, in bringing together this really large group of scientists, our, one of our goals was to 
consider many different parts of the ecosystem that were responding together so that we could attribute if we saw some kind of carbon pulse, was it coming from a leaf process or a stem process or the roots or the soils? And so um, we built an online measurement system that was measuring over 130 points within the ecosystem um, all the time. And we were doing that with um, kilometers of this Teflon tubing that you see in the photo, extending out to leaf chambers or root chambers or stem chambers or soil probes that would let us look at all different parts of the ecosystem. And we had an in instrument shed that housed our specialized instrument to measure carbon dioxide, water, and their isotopes. And we're even looking at these volatile organic compounds in the air. They're like the fragrant, low abundance, but fragrant compounds that we can smell with our noses that are really important to plant um, defenses and, and stress mitigation and also to microbes. And so we had a central shed where we had a lot of instruments that were connected out like in a spider web to the forest to kind of take the pulse of the ecosystem as we took it through this drought and then the recovery phase. Um, and alongside that, there was a lot of other type of sampling that was happening simultaneously. This photo here is showing Eric Daber, one of our um, graduate student um, scientists, and, and he was uh, working on that, that root chamber. And then afterwards, we would take a root sample, for example, uh, store that and use imaging technologies later to better understand it. We took a lot of soil samples, leaf samples. So it was sort of this uh, very integrated, um, experiment looking at many different facets of the ecosystem. And so we started with this beautiful um, shed that we received a generous donation from Daniel and Susan Warmack to um, construct and to power and to cool. And we filled it with a lot of um, dollars and euros of instrumentation, as you see on the bottom right, that we received in shipments from our colleagues from Europe and in the, in the US and, and also brought instrumentation from U of A. So um, yeah, it was a very comprehensive system for monitoring the ecosystem. And if you're just joining us, because uh, we have had some attendees dropping in um, mid-webinar here, uh, we're honored to have uh, Christiane Werner and Laura Meredith uh, joining us. Uh, Laura is an assistant professor at the School of Natural Resources at the University of Arizona, and Christiane is the chair of ecosystem physiology at the University of Freiburg in Germany. Um, and we've been getting some questions uh, from uh, all of our listeners this morning. And uh, uh, Robert Christofferson had a question about the instrument shed. And now that the instrument shed, uh, now that your experiment is no longer in active research, uh, what does the experiment shed look like now? And, and maybe go into the the process uh, too of having to ship all of this equipment uh, across several countries uh, to, to get it built in the first place. Yeah, well, Christiana, would you like to start with the building phase? <laughs> the building phase was a nice phase. Um, it was amazing. We had lots of support from um, the biosphere. It's something really uncommon that you can study something like a forest, but on the same time have really all the luxury of something like a lab next to you but there were many many challenges the first thing was shipping so lots of shippings got delayed one of mine got fully broken so weeks of repair um, but we had this great support from the biosphere it's simple things like european instruments need different electricity than u.s instruments tons of different plugs and stuff it's it's sometimes you think you do this big scientific project and in the end you struggle with a lot of small things to get this set up so it it, it was really weeks and weeks and weeks of plumbing um drawing these lines having a very motivated team to build this all up um yeah i think without really all the support we wouldn't have been able to get all this equipment in place mm -hmm. Yeah, and from the photos, you can see how densely we packed. We had at least 20 different gas analyzers um, at one point in time in this room. Um, and the takedown was, you know, we um, had colleagues come back or who were there who helped uh, disassemble and ship their instrumentation. And we also relied heavily on the University of Arizona team and the Biosphere 2 um, crew to help disassemble and ship back a lot of equipment. And so Right now, the shed very much 
um, is emptied out and looks similar to kind of how it started. We've tried to keep it clean. We have um, some instrumentation that's stained, um, but really it's, a, it's sort of a now a blank slate for another research campaign to come in and ask new questions and build on what we're learning. Um, we did invest in having more environmental sensors in the rainforest, so we have more soil sensors, more atmospheric sensors um, that are there and um, uh, ready to use. So, um, but yeah, this was, this was a campaign style um, you know, type of research where we brought in a lot of equipment, um, focused very intensively to be able to characterize so much of the ecosystem at one time. And then we, you know, we disassembled and uh, we'll start over again someday, so. Um, another great question we have uh, uh, from Tucson here. Uh, they're asking uh, how the biosphere is used both for climate change studies, but also as a, a proxy for studying uh, past climates. Um, and this is an interesting question because we have uh, researchers that are interested in all of our biomes at the biosphere of connecting what they see in real time by manipulating the biomes in the biosphere with events that have happened in the past. So for example, in the rainforest, uh, how would a drought that you guys saw this year uh, be related to a drought that may have happened 100,000 years ago in a rainforest somewhere? And what's the connection uh, between those, those two studies? Um, well, Cristiano, would you wanna speak about Namaya Ladd's research? Namaya is pictured here in the pink shirt climbing in the space frame. So um, Namaya is the third one of our um, lead, leader team ship and she is actually um, using biomarkers um, to study the, the past climate in plants. So there is a lot of information sequestered in, for example, leaf axes in um, compounds which are tightly linked to those volatile organic compounds which plants emit, which are also inside the leaves. And some of them are very, very stable for, for many, many thousand millions of years. So they can go into sediments. And what we can do is we can get information on the isotopic signature of these molecules and defer how the climate was in the past or how plants adapted to this climate in the past. And so this study we conducted here, this experimental drought will also be used to see how this imprints its signature on these biomarkers. So we took leaves, Namaya will analyze them or we'll, as far as we are possible to do it now with Corona, of course, everything is standing still, but um, once we can work again, they will be analyzed in the labs. And so we have now an introduced climate shift with a long drought and we had different phases of the drought. At the beginning, it was a mild drought, then we saw a severe drought. And we can see what signal this is imprinting on these biomarkers. And that can then help once we go to sediment cores or other climate records, compare these changes and see how, for example, past <coughs> tropical forests reacted to different, um, for example, drought scenario. Yeah, and there's a terminology from like satellite retrieval studies where people use satellites to take an image and do imagery of the or surface or atmosphere, but an important part in satellite and remote sensing research is to ground truth, which means to do some work on the ground to verify that the image that you're getting, um, you know, is truly what you think it is, that your interpretation is correct. And in some ways, what we can do with this drought um, is to take samples that help us sort of ground truth, our interpretation of um, past climates or past droughts through things like isotopes in the sediment records, as Christiana was just mentioning, um, or even in tree rings, different information that's stored inside of trees. And so um, one way to think about this controlled ecosystem research is a method to ground truth our understanding in a model system. Great, and uh, we have a question from Heather. Uh, do people still live in the biosphere? And I'll answer that briefly, and, and I'll just say that um, in the early 90s, Biosphere 2 was used as an enclosed uh, experiment. And in the next hour, we actually have a talk with two of those original Biospherians, uh, Jane Pointer and Tabor McCallum. So stay tuned for that. 
Uh, but nowadays, the Biosphere 2 is under different ownership in the University of Arizona, and it's being used uh, to study enclosed ecosystems, particularly these model systems and mesocosms of rainforests, oceans, large uh, hydrology catchment systems. And uh, using the facility in this way has allowed us to uh, develop these experiments that can give us some great insight as Laura and Christiane are, are talking about with things like uh, grounding our understanding of, of, of climate change over large histories of time uh, in truth, in scientific research, uh, but also looking at uh, other kinds of experimental uh, interrelations between species in a forest. And I want to get back to, to your research because uh, in this experiment that you guys conducted, uh, you were studying a variety of both tree and plant species. Uh, and you noticed uh, probably a, a fair amount of differences in the way that they respond to drought and stress. Um, can you share with us some of your findings about uh, those interactions and whether they were uh, interrelated with each other or mostly kind of individual dynamics that you guys were seeing? Oh, maybe I can start. You have this nice picture up here, and this is one of um, the dominant trees, Quatoria. It's a nitrogen fixing trees. And what was super interesting that the, not just between the trees and the understory species, but also within the different trees, he found very, very different reactions. So what you can see already here is that tree on the early onset of drought started um, leaf shedding. So the leaves turned yellow, it looked a little bit like autumn, and it actually dropped a lot of its leaves, which is actually an adaptation for plants because when you're getting into drought, if you have a large leaf area, you need to transpire a lot. If you can shed some of your leaves, the root surface to the leaf surface, the ratio is much better, and actually you can better supply your leaves still with water. However, that strategy only works in trees which have enough nutrients, enough nitrogen to regrow their leaves. So that's a nitrogen fixer is one strategy. And we found very, very different responses in the different tree species we were studying. And that was quite interesting to see the dynamics throughout the drought and how different trees responded at different times. Yeah, and I'll say that um, one type of um, you know, we're looking at root processes and soil processes, and some of those analyses take a little bit longer. We took a lot of soil samples, and um, ex we preserved the microbial DNA and the microbial RNA. So the DNA is like the genes that they have, and the RNA represents the genes that they are expressing at that time because they need certain types of uh, functions, like maybe they have a drought response um, function that they, they need to carry out during drought. Um, and so we preserve those samples and we'll be looking at a microbial species basis to see whether or not certain microbes were more or less active uh, throughout the drought and how that might be related to which plants they were um, interacting with at the root um, interface or even at the leaf interface. Um, and so some of those, those data will be coming online as soon as we can get back in our labs and um, continue our, our research on those samples. Um, but it was, it's really nice to have complementary types of data. One where we're looking in real time at how carbon and water and VOCs are sampling um, with the gas analyzers and then have other types of analyses that we do in the lab that help round out our picture of how this whole ecosystem was responding on a community scale, but also on kind of a species specific scale. And uh, Robert Christofferson asks how the WALD experiment uh, was different from any other drought experiments that have been done in the Biosphere 2 rainforest in the past. Um, maybe Laura, would you be able to answer that? Yeah, I looked at some of the um, recorded past droughts that um, I could find in the literature and in our records. And this was actually one of, if not the most severe droughts that we've conducted. I, I wasn't quite expecting that, but we, um, 66 days is basically at that maximum threshold that's been carried out in the past for research purposes. So it was a very severe drought. Um, 
We also were actively drying the air, drying the soil surface, so it was very severe. Um, I know of past research that has added deuterium tracers to the rain. So this is an isotopic rain, uh, rain tracer, like they added heavy rain essentially and followed that through the ecosystem. Um, and actually what we did in this study was the first way that we added water back to a very desiccated forest was from the bottom up. So we actually put heavy water, this isotopically labeled water at the bottom of the ecosystem because there's a floor, there's a concrete floor and then monitored the ability of deep-rooted plants to access that deep water and bring it up in their transpiration um, stream and we're looking for signals of that in, in the soil system. Um, and so in the past there were some, uh, there have been other droughts and we've learned really interesting um, lessons about um, how inactive um, plants and microbes are during drought and how much activation they get when they're rewetted. Um, but we really applied a new um, approach to the isotope labeling this time. Um, and I think in comparison to all research that has been conducted at Biosphere 2, we just had an unprecedented amount of sampling points and instruments and measuring, sort of monitoring at the same time so we can have a more complete picture than we've ever had of how this system responds. Um, and that was thanks to all these you know, wonderful Folks, we have, you see Christiana here in the photograph along with Namaya Ladd, our other um, co-lead, and we're, they're taking soil samples, or sorry, leaf samples, um, and preserving them very, very quickly by freezing them in liquid nitrogen so that they can later look at um, the different carbon pools in those leaves, including some of those um, volatile organic compounds that Christiana mentioned could even be trapped within the leaf itself. Um, yeah, go ahead, Christiana. Yeah, maybe one thing to add so the deep uh, label watering was laura just mentioned um this is addressing a current really big research question is how important are the deep rooted trees for keeping water in the forest for reaching deep water reserves and that was just a unique opportunity to um, be able to actually add really at the groundwater level of this forest uh, a label trace of it the other really interesting and i think unique um, um, feature we have in this experiment is that we also labeled um, the CO2 in the atmosphere as I mentioned in the beginning and we did this before the drought and it, in the later phases of the drought and what we could see already is there is a very close interaction between the carbon being uptaken by the leaves through photosynthesis but then it's traveling down the trunk and it's going through its roots and directly ending up in the soil and you see it coming out of the soil respiration again. So we traced all these pathways and how it's going into the microbes in the soil, are these processes. And interestingly, once we applied the drought, all these processes were extremely slowed down. So already during the first phase, we applied the label in the leaves and we waited anxiously and it, it took quite um, three, two, three days until we saw it in the stem and then it took another two, three days until we saw it in the soil. And, um, but on a drought, all these processes were way slower. So actually we're getting novel insights, not just what's the drought doing with the total ecosystem, how is the tree responding, but really how is this interaction between the vegetation component, between the soil component and back to the atmosphere is actually happening. Yeah, one of our uh, one of our questions from Facebook was, where did all the carbon go? And you poked at that a little bit, but I just want to describe the um, the effect to which you guys were studying these carbon pathways. And uh, this research team uh, with water, atmosphere, and life dynamics, uh, they were setting up uh, sampling systems at the level of leaves at the level of tree trunks um, in the subsoil. You guys saw some pictures earlier of uh, actually people working below the soil surface in uh, several soil pits, uh, sampling soil and roots. Uh, and in addition, they were also measuring the atmosphere. So uh, they created a real full systems view of how carbon that's um, put into the atmosphere uh, starts to cycle and uh, maybe you guys can speak more uh, to 
that process and that pathway and how is carbon used uh, by trees uh, just in general? It's a good question. I think, okay, I think I can start by saying that one really amazing feature of having what Christiana described as a forest in a cuvette, right? A forest in a contained um, system is that we can really precisely measure the, the total exchange of carbon in and out of the ecosystem. And so we really know, you know, how this carbon is, how this forest is breathing um, to, a, to a very like precise level. And so then our task is to drill down into the different levels within that to ask what are the different contribution from leaves, stems, root, soil within that. And so that's why we had this really um, extensive uh, measurement system. Um, and so what we can provide um, just with the sort of bulk measurements that we do is, is an inventory of this forest and where the carbon is coming in and out of and how much. Um, and maybe I'll ask Christiana to describe how isotopes specifically help us look more deeply at how carbon, how plants choose to spend their carbon and how they allocate it and, and some questions we have in that arena. Mm -hmm. So um, generally we can measure plant photosynthesis, which is the uptake of carbon already on the leaf level, or we can see the total drawdown in the ecosystem. But then once this carbon in form of sugars is in the leaves, there are many, many pathways of what the plant is doing with the carbon. So some of these are invested, for example, in stress protection, in compounds like these volatile compounds, which um, also the emission, especially we saw it for isoprene and later on in the drought also for monotropines, which are some of these specific VOCs, increased a lot under drought stress, which is a protective mechanism for the plant. But then most of the carbon doesn't stay in the leaf. It travels to the trunk, it can go into trunk growth, it can be stored, but a huge part of it is actually going below ground. Um, and um, that can be more than 30% of the carbon, um, which actually is going through the roots, into the roots, and from the roots to the microbes in the soil. And the nice thing when you use these carbon isotope labels is that you can actually trace it and follow it. So we had the analyzers, you can see it here with all these different lines connected to the trunk. We could actually see once this labeled signal of the carbon, which was fixed by the leaf, was traveling down and coming to, to the trunk and being respired by the trunk. And then we can see it in the roots. And in the end, when Laura will do all her analysis, we can see what went out from the roots into the soil microbes and was actually used by them. So this is the very nice way of these isotope labels is that you can actually follow one tracer pulse you apply and how quick and how long it ends up. And in the end, we will also have tree rings and can actually see what is finally stored in the tree, for example, or in the roots or in the soil. And we have a question uh, again from Norway. How can this research con contribute to actually saving the worldwide rainforest? Um, and it's a great question because it, it, it kind of uh, cracks it. How does uh, scientific research uh, fit into kind of the global narrative of some of our uh, ecosystems that are at risk of um, natural resource extraction and uh, you know changing climate and weather. Yeah, I think um, part of what we're trying to understand here is the degree of resiliency of plants to stress, like drought, um, and tropical forests are not only facing drought stress, they face multiple stressors at the same time. Um, and that's kind of increasing in the world as we see increasing frequency of droughts. There's also stressors from land conversion, let's say to a forest, to a different type of ecosystem, and then maybe regrowth to forest. So um, tropical forests are facing multiple stressors at one time. And so what we're doing here is very precisely controlling the drought stressor and asking how resilient are these plants and what are their mechanisms for resilience? And so one mechanism that Christiana mentioned is how, how much can they access deep water reserves and can they sort of share that as a common good um, with other plants that are maybe not so deeply rooted 
or how can they allocate some of their carbon to help produce these volatile compounds that may help them mitigate some of the stress. And so I think one, one big aspect of the, what we're doing here is understanding the resiliency, understanding some sort of thresholds of these types of ecosystems that can then be put into our um, models that help us understand what this might mean on a larger scale where we can't go in and make these detailed measurements um, you know, everywhere around the ecosystem to assess that. We need to rely on our understanding that gets formalized in models to make those larger scale predictions. So some of it I really think is about understanding the environmental tolerances um, that these types of ecosystems have and their strategies for dealing with stress. And maybe just to add is globally, our forest ecosystem and the tropical forests are one of the largest part of this. They are, they are uptaking and storing a lot of carbon. So actually they are buffering about one third of the total CO2 emission from fossil fuel burning and in industry, which means that global change would be like three times more accelerated if the, the we didn't have this big carbon sinks in the forest. Now, once the forests are under drought stress, this declines and one, once we have our total balances um, really worked out, we can precisely nail down the point into drought when the carbon, when the forest turns from a carbon source to a carbon sink. And that is very important if you look at global climate, because if you go to the edge that the, the forests can't really the um, big six anymore, the um, CO2 increase in the atmosphere will accelerate substantially. Uh, now, we're not uh, separate from the forest. And in your experiments, you guys, uh, under two uh, different events, locked yourselves inside the rainforest and released a large pulse of enriched CO2. Uh, how do the scientists and the humans uh, play a part in these carbon systems? And were you worried at all about uh, your presence in the forest being affected or uh, affecting the research? Yeah, I think from a carbon budget standpoint, we weren't um, so concerned with, we, we do respire, we release a lot of um, carbon dioxide. Um, and so we had to be careful when we were near any specific measurement points to not breathe into them and to influence the CO2 measurements we were making. Um, but at the, at the whole forest scale, um, our respiration is not um, critical to, um, to account for. One thing that was critical um, was when we're measuring volatile organic compounds in the atmosphere, um, these can be found at very low levels, like one in a billion, one in a trillion levels in the air, or even lower, one molecule per trillion of molecules of air, you know, some very low abundances. And so we wear a lot of um, products like, shampoo, you know, we use shampoos, conditioners, perfume, lotion, sunscreen that smell. And so that means that they're emitting volatile compounds. And so one step we took as, at the, um, as a scientific team was to be careful about what types of personal care products that, you know, that we wore. So we weren't adding our own sort of um, scents and volatile mix to the system. And certainly we still did. We still, people also release volatile organic compounds. Um, but we did try to mitigate that a little bit to make sure that we weren't unnecessarily affecting our measurements. And we had another question about uh, wind. In an enclosed forest, uh, is there wind? Uh, and how would the presence of that affect or not affect uh, growing 30-year-old organisms? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I can answer that. We, um, I mean, we're, it's enclosed, and so we do have fans that circulate the air, but really our wind stress is very, very low. And that is actually translated to a, a reduction in the strength of some of the woody biomass that the trees use to support themselves. So some of our trees are not as structurally sound as they would be outside because they have not um, endured that type of wind stress. But we do have mixing with fans. Um, and we actually, 
um, have air that comes in from the outside, mixes through the ecosystem, and some of it is released. And so we're, we're using this like an open, like a flow through chamber, which means that we don't have to precisely control the atmospheric balance of carbon dioxide and, and oxygen. Um, but one thing that we characterized was that mixing rate because it's really important for us for measuring the whole ecosystem exchange of carbon and water. Um, and so there's a mixing, there's circulation of the air, um, but there's not really um, strong winds in the system. Great. And we had a question from Carolyn uh, about the original bees and bee die-off in the biosphere. And uh, I think that that question would be uh, best uh, approached for our next uh, webinar with Jane and Tabor, uh, who were original biospherians. But in short, uh, in that early project, we introduced a variety of pollinators into the system, whether it be ants, uh, bees, uh, ladybugs, and uh, some of those species survived and others didn't. I don't have a, a ton of insight myself as to why the bees may have died off, uh, but in this uh, kind of mix of a biospheric, a biological system and a technospheric, all the technical uh, uh, aspects of our facility that support these living systems, uh, there are uh, some opportunities for pollinators to run into trouble. And um, maybe speaking to that, uh, you guys spoke, spoke about it briefly, but uh, what is the uniqueness of having a research facility like this? And this will be our last question. Uh, having things like uh, air mixing and uh, cooling uh, and heating and rain and electricity inside a forest kind of at your disposal. Yeah, maybe I can answer that for somebody who works a lot in, in many other ecosystems. It's fantastic because you are struggling so much if you want to do this type of research in natural ecosystems. You want to make a drought treatment, it rains the whole year. You want to have a control treatment, it gets super dry, your instruments break, you don't have electricity. I mean, Field work is really um, very, very challenging and you could never do something so complete like we did here um, in, in natural ecosystems. There are so many factors you can't control for even if you try to. Um, so I think this is absolutely unique what we have here, the opportunity we got because we could control so many things. But the one point I also really like about this tropical forest in the biosphere that it had the chance to develop freely over many, many years. So it's not a disturbed system, it's not a plantation, it's not just some plants putting together, but the soils developed, the, the trees grew, they grew, there was not much interference. So it established into a natural equilibrium, which is very nice. So the processes we can look at are like in a natural forest, but we have the opportunity to control all the other factors. Yeah, I, I fully agree. And I, I think when you consider how much control we have in this ecosystem and how large it is, um, how much it represents, you know, it, a full ecosystem, um, there's really no other facility in the world that is like this and that is already established. That's a great point. So um, we're always looking to do really exceptional, you know, answer big questions that we can use this exceptional facility to answer that just would be so difficult to tackle using other types of systems. And so um, I think that's what really, what we um, illustrated involved in this experiment was that uh, we can ask these big questions and answer them in a really creative and unique way at Biosphere 2. And um, that's what we're gonna keep looking forward to do uh, in the future with this um, ecosystem and this you know, bias or two in general is to really tackle unique questions that we can only address at this scale um, here. So uh, we were really happy to partner with Christiana and Amaya and to have so many incredible um, young and uh, established scientists involved, so many students, student workers, we had student climbers and they they got involved in all different aspects of this campaign and just incredible support from bias or two and all the staff who like literally made sure we had like the lights on and the water and 
um, everything we needed to, to do this. So yeah, we're really, really grateful to have had the opportunity and look forward to continuing to, to share our results. And we'll end on that note. Uh, I just want to thank both of you, Christian and Laura, for joining us today. And it's a real treat uh, to be able to talk about rainforest research on Earth Day uh, while the biosphere is closed down. And we don't have an open date soon. Uh, we don't have an opening date as of right now, but we will have one uh, as soon as we know more about the kind of continued outlook of the coronavirus. And uh, stay tuned. Uh, meanwhile, I'll be jumping to our next webinar with Jane and Tabor, and you can tune into that on the Biosphere Facebook or in the Zoom webinar uh, that is linked on the Eventbrite page. Uh, so we'll see you very soon. And again, thank you both for joining us and happy Earth Day. Thank you, Aaron. Happy Earth Day to you. Yeah. Happy Earth Day. I can't join you on the <laughs> afterwards. Here it's already evening, so. <laughs> and you have happy a good Earth Day. Having a glass of wine on you. <laughs> Cheers. Uh